members of the class of 2013, congratulations. And welcome to the community of educated women and men. You are now officially credentialed as being smart. <laughs> That's the good news. The bad news, as you will learn as you go forth, is that smart people are a dime a dozen, and they don't usually amount to much. <laughs> what really matters is those who are creative, those who are imaginative, those like Steve Jobs who can think different. And as Stephen Jobs said, and I think one of the greatest of all commencement speeches, he said, I'm just going to tell you three stories. That's it, just three stories. And they come from my most recent biography subjects, Einstein, Franklin, and Jobs. These people were really smart, especially Einstein. He was like real smart. <laughs> but believe it or not, Einstein wasn't the smartest or most educated or considered the most brilliant physicist in 1905. There were many others. He was just a patent clerk in the Swiss patent office. But what Einstein had, like the others, was that ability to think different, that ability to be creative. And that is true of all three of the people I studied. I realized that when you look through their lives, you can even take a Steve Jobs and say, hey, Bill Gates, he had more mental processing power. He might have even been smarter, but there was something imaginative, something creative about Steve Jobs. So the three stories I'm gonna tell you are simply three stories that talk about the need for imagination, that, that ability to think different. Uh, with Steve Jobs, it started when he was a young kid, growing up not too far away in California. When he was six years old, he and his father built a fence around the backyard of their house. And his father told him, we have to make the back of the fence just as beautiful as the front of the fence. Steve made me walk the neighborhood, touch the fence, go look at the back of the fence. And Steve said, why? Nobody will ever see it. Nobody will ever know. His father, who was an auto mechanic, high school dropout, said, yes, Steve, but you will know. People who really care about making things great care about even the parts unseen. So when Steve Jobs started Apple with his friend from down the street, and they were making the original Apple II and then the Mac, at one point before they finished making the Mac, which was this beautiful appliance, and Steve had created a wonderful case for it. He had found the Cuisine Art at Macy's and wanted it to be a beautiful case you couldn't open up, beautiful screen with a wonderful playroom-like uh, design of a graphical user interface. But before they shipped that product, Steve looked at the circuit board they were gonna have inside. And he said to the other engineers on the team, this circuit board stinks. He actually used a slightly stronger word than stinks. He said, they said what do you mean? They said, he said, it's ugly. The chips aren't lined up right. They're not beautiful. And the engineer said, well, that's ridiculous. That's not what you do with a circuit board. Plus, we have it in this enclosed case. Nobody can open it up. Nobody will ever see it. Nobody will ever know. And Steve said what his father had said to him. Yes, but you will know. And they hold up shipping the original Macintosh for a couple of months so they can get the circuit board looking beautiful, even though nobody could open it up or see it. And when they did, Steve had all 30 engineers on the Mac team sign a poster board with their names, with Stephen P. Jobs, all in lower case, to engrave on the inside of the case next to the circuit board, where nobody will ever see it. Nobody could open it up. But he said, real artists sign their work. And his point was that if you have a passion for a product, you really care about connecting beauty to technology, to commerce, and you care about with a passion even for the parts unseen. And that helped him develop a reality distortion field. Those of us who are Star Trek fans know where that comes from, in which he thought he could bend the laws of physics even, bend the laws of human nature 
to get his will. And he would do it over and over again by being passionate, not about making a profit, because he said if you're passionate about making a profit, sometimes you cut corners. But if you're passionate about making a product or a service or passionate about what you're doing, eventually the profits will follow because you'll make things of value. And so when they were doing that original Macintosh, it took a long time to boot up. It took, uh, you know, 78 seconds or something. And he said uh, to Larry Kenyon, you know, it's almost as bad as a Microsoft machine. You've got to make it faster. <laughs> and you've got to take 10 seconds off the boot up time. And Kenyon said, well, look at the code. It's hard. I can't. It's elegant code. And Steve said, don't be afraid. You can do it. Steve, who had learned from his guru in India how to stare without blinking, <laughs> it was a tactic he had. And Kenyon told me, he just kept staring at me and saying, don't be afraid. You can do it. <laughs> Wozniak told me the same story when they were making you know, this original game called Breakout when they were working at Atari. He said, he said, I had to do it in four days. I said, I couldn't. He said, he stared at me and kept saying, don't be afraid. You can do it. <laughs> anyway, Kenyon goes back to his cubicle. And he said, after a couple of weeks, I worked on it day and night. I had shaved 28 seconds off the boot up time. And Steve even did that late in life when he wanted to create the iPhone. And he didn't want it to have a junky piece of plastic on the cover. He wanted the iPhone to have a really smooth piece of glass, unbreakable, tough, smudge proof. And the glass he got from the Claves in China and others didn't meet his high standards. And so somebody at one point said, why don't you call Corning? They know how to make glass. So Steve being Steve just picked up the phone and called the switchboard at Corning Glass in upstate New York and said, let me speak to your CEO. And the switchboard being a switchboard said, fine, we'll take your name and number. We'll have somebody call you back. And Steve said, typical East Coast, whatever, and slammed down the phone. When Wendell Weeks, who was the uh, CEO of Corning, heard about it, he did a cool thing, because he's a cool guy. He picked up the phone and called the switchboard at uh, Cupertino at Apple. <laughs> said, let me speak to your CEO. And they, of course, said, put your request in writing and send it to it. <laughs> Steve heard about that, and he said, that's my type of guy. <laughs> so he meets with Wendell Weeks. He says, this is the type of glass we want for the thing. And Week says, well, you know, years ago we created a, a way of making glass. That was an ion transfer process, and it made really tough, smooth glass, just like you'd want. But we never manufactured it. And Steve went through the process with him and said, that's it. I want this much by September. I'm shipping the phone by October. And Week said, well, you didn't hear me. I said, we've never manufactured it. I actually went to Corning, New York, because I wanted to hear this in person, because I'd heard this tale. And Wendell Week said, it was amazing. This guy who didn't even know how to make glass, he just sat in front of me and kept staring at me <laughs> without blinking and saying, don't be afraid. You can do it. Week said that after the meeting, he called up a plant manager that Corning had, one of their plants in Harrodsburg, Kentucky, just south of Lexington. And he said to the plant manager, who was a friend of his, I want you to switch over and start making Gorilla Glass. And the plant manager said, well, it'll take a while. You know, he said, I want you to do it tomorrow. And the plant manager said, well, we've never done it. We don't have the equipment. And Weeks said, I just kept telling him over the phone, don't be afraid. <laughs> you can do it. The upshot is that October, when the iPhone first shipped, every piece of glass on every one of those iPhones was made in Harrodsburg, Kentucky, by this plant of Corning. And ever since then, every piece of glass on every iPhone and every iPad has been made in America by Corning because of Steve's reality distortion field. <laughs> you know, with Einstein, the story is a little bit different. Catherine spoke eloquently about one of the things we learned from our comic books is the, of the, is the importance of the creation myths. And for us biographers, we always try to find that rosebud, that creation myth, in childhood. And for Einstein, it was getting a compass when he was a kid. His father gave him a compass when he was six or seven years old, and he watched as the needle twitched and pointed north. And he becomes totally mesmerized by this. The needle just, nothing's touching it. Why is a physical object moving like that when nothing physical is touching it? 
What is a force field? What's an electron? And he spent years, his whole life, worrying about why does that work? How does electromagnetism and gravity interact with particles? Now, you and I probably remember getting a compass when we were, you know, six or seven years old. And we go, oh, wow, look, it points north. And about 90 seconds later, we're on to some, oh, look, a dead squirrel, and we're on to something else. <laughs> on his deathbed, he's still writing equations, trying to figure out the connection between electromagnetism, gravity, particles, why that needle points north. When he's 17 years old, he finally studies Maxwell's equations. And if you look at Maxwell's equations, or if you're Einstein and you look at Maxwell's equations, or if you've taken Physics 72 or been in the Millikan building, you know that Maxwell's equations say that an electromagnetic wave, like a light wave, always travels at a constant speed relative to you. No matter which way you're traveling, if you're traveling really fast to the source of the light, or really fast away from the light, the light still travels relative to you at 186,000 miles per second or so, the constant speed of light. And everybody is trying to figure out why. Why does that happen? Couldn't you catch up? And at age 17, Einstein's saying, well, what if I caught up with a light beam? What if I rode alongside it? Wouldn't the wave look stationary to me? But Maxwell's equations don't allow for that. He said, I've walked around in the woods for days on end, my palms sweating. This caused me such anxiety. Now, I don't know about you, but I know what was causing my palms to sweat at age 17 growing up in New Orleans. <laughs> and it wasn't Maxwell's equations. <laughs> but this guy, from that day his dad gave him the compass, has this passionate curiosity to figure out why. And as I said, he was not considered the smartest tack in the box. He couldn't get his doctoral dissertation accepted at the Zurich Polytech. Couldn't get a job teaching there. Couldn't get a job teaching in high school. So he's a third class examiner in the Swiss patent office, but he's still worrying about, what if I caught up with that thing? And he's looking at patent applications to synchronize clocks. Because, you know, a little bit like Rabbi Litwin said, you know, or whatever, you want to go forth, you want to find something special that you can do. So he's looking at synchronizing clocks and it's confusing to him, because to synchronize two distant clocks, you have to send a signal between the two clocks. And the signal travels at the speed of light. So if you're trying to synchronize a clock in Zurich with one in Bern, you have to send a light signal, radio signal, electric signal, whatever. And he's thinking, well, what if I caught up with that signal? What if I caught up with the light wave? Wouldn't it be stationary? But Maxwell's equations don't allow for that. And then he realizes just a leap of the imagination not a leap of mental processing power or looking at friends, but a leap of the imagination and a willingness to think different and challenge the conventional wisdom. Because every other physicist of that time knew what Newton had told them at the very beginning of the Principia, that time marches along second by second, irrespective of how we observe it. And you got this patent clerk saying, how do we know that? How do we know he's right? How would we test that? What if we caught up with the light wave? And he realizes that if you're traveling really fast towards one of those clocks, what looks simultaneous to you, what looks synchronized between the two clocks to you, is different than somebody traveling really fast towards the other clock. And so he comes up with the idea, this leap of the imagination, that yes, the speed of light is always constant, but time is relative depending on your state of motion. That's all the basic creative leap involved in the special theory of relativity, but it upends uh, 20th century science, all because he thought different. He had that leap of the imagination. And as for Ben Franklin, you know, he too was a runaway when he was young. This is why I'm not often asked to speak at college graduations. All three of my people run away at age 17 for a while. <laughs> but you know, Benjamin Franklin had that passionate curiosity, but he also had a sense of tolerance. And to me, that was a lesson learned in childhood. He grew up in Boston, a Puritan-dominated place. His brother wouldn't let him write for the newspaper. So he slipped uh, pieces under the door using a pseudonym, Silence Do Good. But he runs away from Boston when he's not allowed to go to Harvard, and he does something much better. He becomes a newspaper journalist. Uh, 
And what he does when he gets to Philadelphia is he creates a club, a club of, uh, called the Leather Apron Club, which is for the shopkeepers and artisans of Philadelphia. Because there were clubs for the wealthy gentry of Philadelphia and even working men's clubs. But he said, we're going to try to create a new type of nation based on we the middling people, we the middle class people who own shops on Market Street and wear leather aprons. And in that club, they listed the virtues and values that you ought to have to be a great citizen of your community. And if you've read the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, you'll know the 12 of them in their industry, honesty, frugality. And being a geek, he marks them on a chart and marks every week how well he does on each of those virtues until he can master them. And then he shows it around to the people in his leather apron club that he has mastered all 12 of those virtues. And one of the members of his club says to him, Franklin, you've forgotten a virtue you might want to practice. And Franklin said, what's that? And the friend says, humility. You might try that one for a change. <laughs> Franklin's great insight. He says, I was never very good at the virtue of humility. I never mastered it. But I was very good at the pretense of humility. I could fake it very well. Now, here's his insight. And he said, and I learned that the pretense of humility was just as useful as the reality of humility. <laughs> It made you listen to the person next to you. It made you try to find that common ground. And that was the essence of the middle class democracy that we were trying to found. So for the rest of his life, he's the person amongst all the founders and everybody else who helps bring people together. He's the one when Congress creates a committee to uh, declare why we're fighting the war of independence. It's probably the last time Congress created a good committee but it's got Ben Franklin, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson on it. And he's the one who helps edit that wonderful second sentence, where Jefferson begins by saying, we hold these truths to be sacred. And you see Franklin's black printer's pen, self-evident, he writes. Because he wants to make the point that our rights uh, come not from the dictates of religion, but from rationality and reason and consent of the governed. The sentence goes on, and they're endowed with certain inalienable rights. And you see John Adams' handwriting, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And so what you see, even in this collaborative, wickified process of writing a Declaration of Independence, <laughs> the ability to balance something we've lost in Washington now, balance notions like the role of divine providence with the role of rationality and reason in, in securing our rights, this notion of coming together and using things to bring us together. That was Franklin's great strength, even uh, at the Constitutional Convention when he comes back from France. He's pretty old. He's 82. They're tearing themselves apart between the big state and little state issue. And he's the one who says, I'm the oldest person in this room, but the older I get, something amazing happens to me. I learn that I'm wrong at times and I'm fallible. And he said, it's going to happen to you. So look at the person next to you, just like he'd said back in the Leather Apron Club when he was 17, and think that maybe they have something to offer, that maybe the diversity of our opinions will lead to a common ground that's stronger than any one of our opinions. And he, his point was that compromisers may not make great heroes, but they do make great democracies. So he said, when we were young tradesmen and we had a joint of wood here in Philadelphia that didn't hold together, We'd shave a little from one side and take a little from the other until we had a joint that would hold together for centuries. And so, too, we here at this convention must each part with some of our demands. And he's the one who makes a motion to have a House and a Senate, that creative compromise that brings a big state, little state issue together. Uh, but in conclusion, let me say that they all had something more than these three little tales three little traits. They all had one trait that they shared. They all realized that they were part of something larger than themselves. When I graduated from college on this type of day, when I was standing there, the reverend of our college, the minister of the church at our college, gave us a sermon that morning. The title of the sermon was, What We Forgot to Tell You. And uh, the Reverend Gomes, he said, 
At one point, a student had come up to him and said, uh, and Reverend Gomes had asked him, what do you want to do when you leave college? He said, I want to be powerful. I want to be important. I want to be president of the United States, maybe. And Peter Gomes had said to him, you know, to the student, he said, you should aim higher. <laughs> he said, this college has produced a lot of successful people. It even produced a few presidents. But the more important thing it does is it produces a few people who are good. So aim not just to be successful, aim to be good. Aim higher, aim for doing good in this world. All over the, you know, the country right now, there's probably people of my generation, the baby boomer generation, giving graduation speech. And I predict that most of them are saying the same thing, which is follow your passion. Follow your passion wherever it leads you. I'm going to tell you something different, though. It ain't about your passion. It's about being part of something larger than yourself. It's about connecting your passion to what's engraved on those gates, that you will go forth and give benefit to mankind, that you will go forth and be good. Because at the end of the, your days, when you look back, when you come back for your 50th reunion, your family, your kids, your grandkids, the people you graduate who are sitting next to you, who come back with you to that 50th reunion. It's not just about seeing how successful you were, who you were, how much toys or trinkets or power you accumulated. It's about what you created and what you did to make the world a slightly better place because you were here. During his lifetime, Ben Franklin gave, uh, donated, to the building fund of each and every church that was built in Philadelphia. At one point, they were building a new hall in Philadelphia for itinerant preachers who were coming through because of the Great Awakening, so traveling preachers that they had to offer a pulpit to. It's still to the left of Independence Hall, still called the New Hall. He wrote the fundraising document, and he said, even if the Mufti of Constantinople were to send somebody here to preach Islam to us and to teach us about Muhammad, we should offer a pulpit, we should listen, for we might learn something. And on his deathbed, he was the largest individual contributor to the Mikveh Israel Synagogue, the first synagogue built in Philadelphia. So when he died, instead of his minister accompanying his casket to the grave, all 35 ministers, preachers, and priests of Philadelphia linked arms with the rabbi of the Jews and marched with him to the grave. It was that notion, that notion of good-natured tolerance and a belief of listening to everybody else, whatever their background. That was a great contribution that our founders made, and Ben Franklin in particular made, to the creation of this country. And it's what we were fighting for back then and what we're still fighting for in the world today. As for Einstein, even on his deathbed, 1955, an ordered burst, he knew he wasn't going to live, he had declined an operation, at the hospital, Princeton Hospital. He asked that his papers that were on his desk be brought to him. And on that last day, he just writes line after line of mathematical equations between people visiting him. He kept writing nine full pages. You can go not too far from here to the Einstein papers at Caltech. And there they are, and you can see them. Line after line of equations that still wonder what, how would you create a unified field theory that would connect gravity, electromagnetism, particles? In other words, why does that needle keep twitching and pointing north? At the very end, you can see when the pain becomes too great, he writes just one last line of equations that dribbles off that page that he thought would get him and the rest of us just one step closer to what he called the spirit manifest in the laws of the universe. And as for Steve Jobs, it was about two years ago when I think he realized he might not outrun the cancer. And I was with him in Palo Alto, and I was asking him, what, what do you see as your legacy? What do you see as a meaning? And he said, part of it is my Zen Buddhist training, and part of it is what I've watched in life, is that life is sort of like the flow. It's like a flow of a river. It's like history and how it flows. And we get to take really, really cool things out of that flow. 
We get to take things people have invented, educational theories they've come up with, theories of relativity, how to make a transistor, even great products that people have invented, buildings that people have built, that we get to take from the flow of history. But your legacy is not how much you accumulate and take out of that flow. Your legacy is what do you put back into that flow. That maybe afterwards, there'll be a few people who say, oh yeah, that was cool. I get to use that thing that Steve Jobs or any of us might have put back in the flow of history. So when you leave here, read the gate and make sure that you too both follow, follow your passion but connect that passion to something greater than yourselves. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir.